everybody, and welcome to the FFL Solidity Team Call. Today is Thursday, December 28th, so we're officially going into the first week in terms of Family First Life um, of the year. So that's really, really exciting. But with that being said, we have a very special guest on the call with us today, somebody that I think it's far overdue to be really honest. Um, he's hit Hall of Fame in home. He's also hit Hall of Fame during doing telesales. And being that versatile, it's like grab that pen and paper because guys, that's a skill. Um, somebody who works extremely hard and I've admired from afar for a long time. So we have Mahmoud Nasser on with us today. Mahmoud, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you guys again for having me on and I'm excited to help out anybody I can, you know, anything I've learned. Hey, well, we appreciate you and it's an honor to have you on with us today. Just to kind of hit the call off, Mahmoud, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of what you were doing before Family First Life and kind of what drove you into the insurance industry and, you know, like why Family First Life? Yeah. So when I first got started, um, I was actually in college, finishing up my senior year at the University of Kentucky. And I was getting a business finance and management degree. I was working at a used car lot. And it was just like, I don't know, I was never able to make money. Like I would work and then I would just you know, pay my tuition pretty much. And uh, Wiley Hawkins, I'm sure you guys know him. He was a good buddy of mine, like, since I was like 15, 16 years old. And like, I watched him for like 20 months, like, like him kind of grow and just traveling all over social media. And like, I just sat there and watched him and watched him. And uh, yeah, I mean, I started out part time, like finishing up college. I was like, I'm gonna see if it's real. You know, if not, like, I just got a degree, I can go work in a bank or do anything, you know? So I, I gave it those 30 days part time, just kind of working the weekends. And like that first month I you know, I deposited probably like seven, eight thousand. And I was like, all right, this is real. And then uh, ever since then, like I graduated and I've been full time running and gunning since. Love it. So um, essentially, you saw Wiley kind of doing his thing from afar on social media. You guys have known each other for some time. You were like, let me try this thing out while I kind of wrap up college see if it's for me. You wrapped up school and you're in it full time. Yep. Beautiful. And you hit Hall of Fame your first full year in the business. Is that right? Yep. What do you think the biggest contributor to that was? Uh, honestly, it was just like, no matter how great the week was or, you know, how I could have done better, I'd always show up like right in the morning. I was hitting the phones and dialing, booking appointments, like no later than 830 every day. Love it. And, you know, even when I talked to you really quickly this morning, Mahmoud, I love that you were basically like, hey, like, I can talk for a second, but like, I gotta go, like, I'm working, right? Like, you're like, now we're 10 minutes before the call, right? But that also just shows, like, how seriously, like, you take it. Guys, when we don't take our schedule seriously, it's not going to look serious in terms of results. So I kind of love how you came in, you know, you said, I'm going to give it 30 days, you kind of saw your own results, and you jumped in from there. Um, now, you write at a high level, and you're all telesales at this point. Um, talk to us a little bit about your lead flow, um, and particularly kind of how it's evolved since you were newer to telesales to now. Yeah, absolutely. So like when I was starting out in the field, I just started out, at, you know, the ILC, Instant Internets, one month. And then, you know, once I started making more money, I got into direct mail, and then like at the end of the last year, you know, when I hit Hall of Fame, I was trying to transition out of mail. And I was seeing a lot of people transition to telesales. So I I just tried fit like a bunch of different Facebook leads. And like I was final expense Facebook leads for a good, you know, eight, 10 months in a row. And then uh, like lately, it's been starting like the social media mortgage leads. You know, we get a producer bonus with the voucher and like those are gold. You know, I, I've probably written like seven families this week on it. And it was from a free voucher. Like I didn't even spend a dollar on those leads. And I think right. it's just and having a, like a big thing about telesales is because when you're in home, you know, we're buying leads twice a week, Monday, Tuesday, we're dialing. But with telesales, you're on the phones every day. You know, every day is a dial day for you. So just constantly having a fresh set of leads to be able to go through them. And I always tell everybody, I mean, if you can get 50, to 80 fresh leads a day from Facebook, you should be able to hammer out, you know, 300, 400 dollars in a day. And I always tell everybody on telesales, you know, like how in the field we would shoot for whatever, eight up uh, eight to ten appointments a day. I shoot for six to eight presentations a day on the phone. <clears throat> so if it's and, like a 
And Mo, what do you, sorry to interrupt you. What do you consider like a presentation? Uh, so like a presentation is like, I get the why we go through the client suitability sheet, you know, and I give them numbers and I ask to close. Okay. So you get all the way to the close and for you, you're like, that's a presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Love it. All right. And are you predominantly, so with that being said, so you started kind of how everyone starts, in my opinion, with ILC leads, you were doing your thing, grinding it out, probably, you know, getting, you know, beat up on the phones, right? I think it's important. Everybody knows we all get beat up on the phones here, there, everywhere, whether we're new, we've been seasoned, it's just part of the game. Um, and then you work some direct mail. Um, I can also relate on working myself out of direct mail, not the easiest thing, but with Facebook and all the different things that we have access to in terms of resources, it's like, there's no excuse as to why anyone's like, I don't have leads outside of like, I didn't care to buy leads, right? So I love how you're saying in home, right? Like we had to be prepared on Monday and Thursday for those dial days. Telesales, we have to be prepared every single day because every single day is a dial day. So lead flow is going to really equivalent to cash flow, right? Um, now, with your actual schedule, Mahmood, what does it look like? Do you schedule your appointments? Do you one call close? Do you do kind of both? Do you have set hours? Talk to us a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah, so I'm I hop on Zoom right at 9 a.m. My first dial is usually no later than like 9 15, 9 30. And I I dial the phones till you know seven, eight o'clock. Like I I truly enjoy what we do. Like I don't really look at this as working. Like there's people out there in the heat, in the cold, sitting there busting their tail. I'm sitting in a chair calling people. Like I don't look at this as working. So I mean that that's pretty much my schedule every day. Like hop on early and being on the Zoom is super key there, I feel like. You know, because like if you're sitting there dialing alone, I feel like, you know, there's no camaraderie and it just kind of sucks, you know. But when you're on Zoom, it kind of makes the time go by quicker. You can help someone that needs help on the spot. They can help you. And I, I feel like that makes the time go by a lot, a lot more quicker. I would agree. And, you know, Mahmood, if you had if you could think about your group right now, right. And you said like, OK, Zoom doesn't exist. Right. Hypothetic. Stay with me. Do you think that you and or your group would be performing at the level that they are without that camaraderie. Absolutely not. I don't think so. Right. And it's like, you know, too, when you wake up in the morning, it's like your, you know, your team expects to see you on the virtual office, right? If you will. So it's like, if you don't show up, it's kind of awkward, right? Like you're like, you're the one saying like, Hey, we should jump on this thing. So it's like, guys, like if you're not getting on live dials and you're doing telesales, like, Mahmood, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I would just assume like you're not doing telesales because why would you not plug into the dial team, right? Like, would that be fair? Yeah. Like, if one of your guys doesn't show up, Mahmood, you're not like, I wonder if they're just dialing along. You're like, they're, they're not dialing, right? 100%. So it's like, show up, right? So I, I love that. And um, the whole like, I'm on at 9 a.m. It's like, guys, whatever your schedule is going to be, it's going to be like, Mahmood's killing it, you know. How many families are you helping on, like on average every month? Oh, I mean, it, it varies, but I'd say like the last two months I did 50, like 55. Okay. okay. Awesome. So like, we're talking to someone guys who's helping, you know, like 50, 60 families, extremely humble by the way, which I love, but like, guys, like let's take notes. Like he's up every day, 9am. He's like 915. My first phone call is going out. Like I'm, I'm not confused and I'm on the phones and I could be doing something way more laborious so to say or way more tedious so i don't really look at this like it's the worst thing in the world if john hangs up on me, right it's just next right um now when it comes to telesales versus in home right we can talk about things like you know like i know for me when i was in home like door knocking like it was that thing that nobody wanted to do but like we got to do it right if we don't our numbers are going to show it um, and those things that we kind of have control over, if you will, um, what are some of like the most like prominent things from a telesales end that when you transition from in-home to telesales, you feel like you were like, Hey, like this is really important. Like whether it's a tool, it's a time, it's a schedule. Like what did that look like? Yeah. So there's a, a couple of things I'd recommend there and regarding, uh, I guess like credentials, because like when you're in someone's face to face, you know, it's completely different. Like they know you're real. They can trust you right then and there. So I like to establish credibility on the phone real quick. 
So like as soon as I verify the client, their birthday, I'm like, hey, do you receive text messages? And they're like, yeah. And then I'm like, cool, I'm just required to send you over my credentials so you know I'm a licensed and active professional. And so I send them a picture of my uh my card. It was something I used to give to families in the field, but it's just a picture of my face on it. You know, it says mortgage protection, burial insurance, annuities. And uh, I send that with the credibility sheet that shows like Aflac, Mutual of Omaha, Americo. And I, I feel like setting that credibility right there off the bat, that helps a lot. And then one thing I learned was like in the, in the field, you know, we get no showed, we got the door knocks and here it's like, you get no showed on an appointment, you know, you can just call the next lead essentially, you know, but one thing that, that my team uses, and I feel like it helps us a lot. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's in, it's a CRM called Ringy. And it we use it kind of to like initially send out texts to the leads as well for the people that don't pick up the phone. So it drips on them for like four or five, six days. So like it's constantly texting them. Like I'll just get random call-ins from it. Like, hey, we got a text message. Uh, this is incomplete or, you know, I'm about to be disqualified. What's this about? And I feel like that helps a, a lot there. And then just tracking your presentations, like, you know, if I'm shooting for eight today, if I've got four, like I'm looking at it at the box, you know, if you have four little boxes left, it kind of like motivates you to keep going. Like, all right, I got to get two more presentations at least, you know? Absolutely. So I'm hearing like establishing credibility, super important over the phone. Um, I definitely learned that the hard way in mood, I was getting like, you know, told to fly a kite for the first, like, you know, like 14 days. I was like, what am I doing now? No credibility. Um, so I love that. Um, also ringing those drips and just kind of, um, I like how you're using different verbiage, so to say, like, Hey, you're going to be, you know, take it disqualified or, you know, your, your time is up kind of type of text that you have people calling into you. I think that that's really important. Um, and then also, like you said, just tracking your presentations, just like in the field, we tracked, you know, how many appointments do we have? How many do we sit with? How many do we sell? It's the same type of deal. We want to make sure we're tracking those numbers so we're not head faking ourselves, right? Like, Mahmood, like my first month of transitioning to telesales, like I got no showed and I was like, oh, like, what do you do now? Like, what, like, what do people do? Like, you know, I was just like, and, and obviously you just pick the phone up and dial, but I wanted to overcomplicate it, right? So guys, like, make sure you're tracking these things because I look back at those 14 days and I'm like, wow, Marisa, you had faked yourself that you were working so hard. But like all you were doing was writing out like how many people know show you, right? And obsessing over it. So guys, just move, move on to your next appointment and keep going. Um, and with that being said, are you predominantly one call closing? Are you setting up appointments, doing a little bit of both? What does that look like? So like I always shoot for the call to close. I feel like that's the most effective way. Now, not everyone's going to be home. Some people might be at the doctor's office. Some people might be working. So like, then we don't have a choice but to book the appointment with them. And I just like to figure out like a set time, like, hey, when's going to be a good time where you're, you know, you're going to be at home, like after five o'clock, got it. And I'll call them from five, six, seven, whenever I get a chance. And I, I always try to have them like a little tie down whenever I book an appointment with them to try and remember it. Because like you said, I mean, if they know show us in the field, they're sure as hell no show us on the phone, you know? So I always try to, tie something down, whether it's like a social media mortgage, I'll ask him like, Hey, uh, just so I can properly prepare for you. When you sent this in, you know, was your main concern to just make sure the mortgage is covered in the event of a death? Or are you concerned about a sickness like a heart attack, stroke, cancer? And I'll just make a note of that. And same thing for like a, a regular final expense plan, like were you just wanting a burial or cremation or where you want to leave something else behind as well. And I feel like that helps a lot for the appointments because it's like, all right, they you know what I'm calling for. And it, I feel like it, it'll help establish too. Absolutely. That helps you kind of establish that you're doing business from the beginning of your actual phone call to set up that appointment. Um, and that is really important, a tie down. You know, it's like, guys, if we're just like, hey, talk to you tomorrow at three. It's like, if I tell my sister that, I'm, I'm probably not going to call her tomorrow at three. So like, we want to make sure we're having them write it down and we're doing something that's helping them remember it. You know, if Mahmood asked me, you know, like, were you looking to be protected if you were to, you know, pass away, get sick, get hurt? You know, you know, what was the concern? Like, I'm going to start thinking about why I filled it out, which is exactly why he's asking that. So it's like psychology behind that, guys. Like, let's make sure we're tying it down for sure. So I love that. Um, 
Now, being on Zoom, being on Zoom and doing telesales and being committed to the process, so to say, um, what are your true like non-negotiables? Um, whether that's for yourself and or your group, like what are some things that you're like, I'm not like like this cannot happen or like like it's just it's it's a non-negotiable. What does that look like for you? I mean, non-negotiables are honestly, I feel like it's just showing up. You know, like I, I told someone like there was a new guy, you know, he was starting out part time and it was like, I'll be on Zoom tomorrow. And like he didn't show up. And it was just like, well, why would you say that? And then I, it took me a second to like break it down to him. I was like, look, like I can only do so much to help you, you know, as your mentor, you're, you know, the guy that's trying to help you put on. But like you can't help someone that doesn't want to be helped at the end of the day. And I feel like we we do a pretty good job at that to where all the guys can hold themselves accountable. And, you know, if they want to be a part of the culture of the team, like they're, they'll they show up every day unless, you know, they have something or they choose not to. That's completely up to them. But, I mean, non-negotiables for all my agents is having leads ready to dial and just hitting the phones all day. I mean, that that's pretty much all it is. It, what we do, like you said, there's no need to complicate what we do. It's super simple. We're just guys, like a group of young guys. We all got the goal. Like we want financial freedom. We love helping people. And this is the perfect opportunity for it, you know? Absolutely. And I love how like, you're like, you know, my non-negotiables are that I show up. Right. And it's like, there's a lot within showing up, but at the same time, it's like, guys, if you show up every single day and you do what you said you were going to do, your results will speak volumes. Might not be on the first day, might not be on the second day, but I can tell you like, that work at compounds, like no matter what, like you might have the day, like you're like, I don't even think the day could go this bad. That's going to compound into a way that something good is going to come out of it in this business. Like I always say, it's like the insurance gods, like, but that's, that's just how it works, guys. Like you put the work in, you might not get the you know immediate result, but you will get the result. Um, so uh, I love that. I was going to say, I'll share a quick story. We got our, one of our top guys on the call right now, actually, I mean, and when he first started, like he wasn't the best on the phones. Like it was maybe two weeks where he didn't get a sale, but it was something about him. Like he showed up every single morning and he was on the phone till six, seven, eight o'clock till he needed. And when he missed the sale, he would call me, call Ron. He'd be like, Hey, what did I do wrong? What can I do better? And like, it was literally like that for two, three weeks. And uh, he's one of my boy's brothers-in-law. So he's like, he's married to his sister. He's like, dude, we got to make sure he's good. And I'm like, well, no, nah, he's doing everything he needs to do. And like after the two weeks of just doing everything, it clicked for him. And like once it clicked, you know, like you said, the re the results will follow as, as long as the activity and consistency is there. There's like it's worked for thousands of other people for like over a hundred of years. There's no reason why it wouldn't work for you. Absolutely. And I think that that story, like it's like just like perseverance, right? It's like it might have been something as small as tonality on the phone. And, you know, he was like, hey, I got to fix this. But now you said he's one of the top producing agents within your group. It's like, what if he gave up on himself, right? Like it might look a lot different for him now. So like, guys, just remember, just like he's just like Mahmoud just said, like, it's not supposed to be easy day one. Now, is it always going to take, you know, two weeks, two months? No. But for me, it took a month when I came into the industry to sell a policy to my own sister. But guys, no one can be as bad as I was when I was 20. So don't worry about that. But guys, seriously, if you show up each and every day, you do the small things that you say you're going to do, the result's going to follow. It's like, Mahmoud, if he stopped reaching out to you, Ronnie asking for help, it's like, he might have just like, at that point, it's like he threw the towel in, right? He's like, oh, I tried, right? But it's like, he showed up and showed up and showed up. And guys, that's how you win, right? Um, We have so many examples of that, that are actually people that are on the dial team. And I just don't think that that's... um confusing at all I think it's pretty straightforward you know you show up you get results um so I love that um now in terms of telesales like when you're in home for me anyways I was really big on building the why right like I did a lot of mortgage protection I also did final expense um but I was really big on like you know if you don't sell me on why you need the insurance like I'm not going to sell you the insurance right so I asked a lot of questions to paint pictures um what I've realized for me anyways, is sometimes I'll be like over talking on the phone, but you can also under talk on the phone, right? Not ask enough questions. Um, 
With that being said, Mahmoud, what does that look like in terms of kind of building the why from in home to on the phone? Would you say it's the same for you? Different? What does that sound like? I'd say it's it's essentially the same thing, honestly. Because like once you verified, you know, your credentials in the beginning of the call, and like you let them know like this is what we're gonna do today. It's pretty much the same. I'd say the only thing a little different is like when you're going into a home, like you booked an appointment, they know you're coming. When I get someone on like a call a close, for example, it's same thing. It's still having the assumptiveness, you know, whatever kind of lead it was. It's like, hey, most families that send this in just want to make sure that their burial doesn't fall burden on your loved ones. Was that your main concern? Yeah, got it. And then I, I get that before I even go into the client suitability sheet, just so I know that, you know, you know, we're talking about insurance today. <laughs> and love then it, it. regular client suitability sheet questions, you know, asking about, all right, you want to be buried or cremated and then asking the uncomfortable questions like, hey, you know, something happens to you today. Who's the beneficiary going to be the one responsible tomorrow? And do you guys have ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 saved up? Any life insurance? Like, why don't you have any life insurance? Is it you can't get approved for it? You can't afford it or you just never got to it? And when you ask those questions, just like you said, like they're uncomfortable questions, right? And like, but at the end of the day, like they need to be asked. It's also going to help you as the agent best like lead, guide, and direct that client to the proper product. If you know that they applied for life insurance 20 times this month, you might, you know, be like, okay, we're looking at a G, like a GI situation. But it's important to ask those questions, guys, because it's painting the picture for the client of like, what is it going to look like if you died yesterday? Like who's picking up the pieces? Okay, your daughter, like, you know, like, okay, does she have 10, $15,000? She can put you to rest properly. Are they most, are they the most comfortable questions? No, but our job in this industry is to get uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable every single day in this business, like get out of it because you're not growing. And I remember asking those questions the first time on the phone, Mahmoud, and I'm on the other line, like, okay, like I hope they don't think this is weird. And they're, they're just answering them just as if I'm in the home, because it's like, if you don't overthink it, they're not all going to overthink it either. It's like asking for the social. If I'm like in my mood, I'm, you know, and we please need your social security number. And like, this is why, because verse my mood in your social, like, right. Like you're going to just give it to me. So it's like, guys, we want to just remember where we're actually trying to go and the, why we're trying to build. At the end of the day, if somebody doesn't know why they purchased something, they could love you on the phone. Maybe you talk to that 75 year old that's just bored that day, right? And they're like, just trying to chat for 30 minutes. And they might like you and buy the policy, but if you didn't pull up the why they need it, the what's gonna happen if, like the who, what, when, where, why questions, if you're not asking any of those, the probability of that business sticking is slim to none, right? Like. You wrote the policy, someone's going to call like Mahmood after you, and he's going to outright your business because he's going to build the why. So building the why, you would say super similar to in the home. You just have to ask those uncomfortable questions. Yeah, because I used to always say the same, like if there's no why, there there is no buy, you know? I like that. I love because, that. Because like, I mean, even if you get an objection at the, the end of the application, whatever it may be, I need to think about, it, I need to talk to my wife. It's really hard for someone to turn back on something when they sat there and told you, like, I need this for my wife. Like, we don't have 10,000. We don't have insurance. Like, it's really hard for someone to say that. And then you can really pinpoint the problem. Like, is it the price or what's the issue? Right. And oftentimes it, it is the price, right? And you show them a lower option and they're like on board with it. So it's like sticking to the process, just like you said you would. And again, asking follow up questions at the end. If you are getting kicked back, that might not be comfortable. But again, guys, that's our job is to help protect people. Um, now, as you're kind of going through your process, if you will, you know, like in the home, on the phone, it does the sales process, if you will. Like, what are the pieces that you're making sure like, okay, like, you know, like maybe you're listening to one of your, your, new, your new guys dial and you're like, oh, they just missed this. Like, they're going to get some kickback at the end. Like, what are the most prominent pieces you feel like you have to hit on to have a successful telesale? Okay. So uh, definitely establish the why in the beginning, like the need for the coverage, essentially, you know, whether they want it for a burial, protect their mortgage, or just get a policy, leave some money behind. You got to have that why. And then I think 
like obviously the beneficiary and kind of getting a little backdrop there, whether it be the wife, the daughter, and making sure that they understand what the situation looks like, something happens to them tomorrow. Like whether that be, you know, a loss of income in the family uh, or just not having the funds saved up, I, I think you have to really hammer that. Absolutely. And then I feel like, especially with telesales, whenever you're doing the underwriting, I feel like it's good to to know the prescriptions. Like I write them out for the guys because it took me a few months to get it down. But like when you're asking someone, hey, do you have blood pressure? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, do you take lisinopril, metoprolol, and lodipine? I sound a lot more professional, you know? And I've had people say like, oh, wow, like, how'd you know that? It's like, well, I'm a medical underwriter. Wouldn't you like expect me to know that? And I'll use like, wouldn't you hope I know that? And I feel like that helps a lot. And then uh, another big thing like I learned in the field too is in the, like, you know, once you get the why, you're kind of going over their income. You know, they tell you if they're retired, disabled, whatever. I always ask them like, hey, for your financial institution, do you use a local bank or do you use a state direct express card? And I feel like especially when you're doing final expense, like that'll go a long way. Because when I first started, I'd get to the end of an America app and they'd pull out a little card and I'd be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> and I'd have to be in there for another 10, 15 minutes. Right. And then... uh. Also, whenever I'm doing the, so yeah, it's pretty much, I'd say during the presentation. Now, when I'm presenting numbers, I, I always say this. I'm like, hey, just so you know, like this process here isn't like going to a grocery store like Kroger or Walmart, where you can just see it, like it, buy it. But this kind of thing, we do have to get approved for it. So what that means is, you know, the carriers will look at something that's called the Medical Information Bureau, which is also known as the MIB. Are you familiar with it? No, the MIB is just a compilation of prescriptions, medical records, hospitalizations. That's just how they can identify you, check your medical records. And I just tell them, like, that's how we're going to be able to get you the immediate day one coverage benefit without having to be on a two-year wait and period like most insurance carriers or having to go through any paramedical blood work, physicals, or any of that funky business there. I'll be like, all right. And I tell them, okay, so here in a sec, I'm going to punch everything into the state system. While I'm doing that, I just need you to grab a sheet of paper and a pen so I can have you write down the benefits of your plan. They're super important. And then I just literally have them write down every single benefit, immediate, locked in, tax-free, all that good stuff. And I feel like that helps a lot. Love it. And it's funny because like, as you said that aloud, I'm like, oh, I use your script. Like, you, you know, um, so like, thank you for like putting that together. Like the see it, like it, buy it. Like we have to apply for it. Um, like guys, that's powerful. And it's also walking the person through the process. Um, another thing you hit on that was big medical, right? It's like, guys, by the way, like, I don't know all the medicines in the world, but once you've been doing this for even a month, 90 days, you're going to start picking up on things like lisinopril, amlodipine, you know, metformin, um, glipizide, et cetera. And you're going to like know what they're for. And it does really help out. But what else I would kind of like add to there is like, if, if my mood's on the phone with somebody is able to be like, okay, is that amlodipine or metropolol? Like, and they're like, oh, it's amlodipine. It's like, now they're more likely to actually give him all of their medications because they trust him. more. Like, that's my personal opinion, but it's like, that's also what I've seen in doing it. Um, and then the banking institution, that's really important. Um, I've also been in that situation that you get to the end of the America app, they pull up the green direct express card and you're like, oh man, I ran the wrong app, right? Um, so I think making sure you're asking that on the front end, um, no matter what type of appointment it is, it's also setting the stage for like, we need your bank information to submit this application, right? Um, so that's beautiful. Um, and then the, the state system. I love that because you're basically making it like, hey, we're going to pull up three recommendations. And from there, we're going to go ahead and apply for one. Um, and it's not necessarily your recommendation. It's the state's recommendation, which everything's state regulated. So I would 100% agree with that. Um, so I love that. Um, now, you, on your team, Mahmoud, you have guys that are killing it you know you guys are issuing your average writers somewhere between like 20 you know 20 to 30 families a month which is awesome you talked a little bit about this but what would you say you think contributes the most to having a group where you know like that's not the average writer within the company like why do you think your average writer is so much higher than other people's uh, i think like 
going back to like the culture that we have, like I'd say we're more close knit than like your regular group. Uh, like we're on Zoom talking all day, joking about it. And, like even after work, like we we'll, we still talk to each other. Like it's not like we're just colleagues and that's it. It's more to that, you know. It's like I I truly look at these guys as like brothers or sisters, and like I I truly care for them. You know, like if I'm the one that's mentoring them, like I want to make sure that they're successful because, you know, that's just how it is. And I feel like that culture there, just us being together and grinding it out every day. It's like, I don't know. I don't see anything better than it. You know, we hype each other up really and just keep the fire going. Absolutely. And I think it's like, you know, also like that goes to like the fear of missing out. Right. It's like if I'm on your team and you're all killing it, like I'm going to get on there for the sole reason of like, I don't want to be the person that's not killing it and not part of that culture. Right. Like that's an exciting thing to be a part of. So it's like, guys, once again, like let's like, let's plug in. Like a lot of you guys I talk to just like my mood saying like outside of work, right. Like we're like brother and sister. But at the same time, it's like, guys, we got to plug in. And like, that's how we win together. Um, And then for the people that aren't killing it, it's like the good thing about our group is like, we're all there to help each other. It's like if they hear him say something wrong and I'm on the phone, like they'll automatically help him. Like I don't have to tell them to do anything. It's like because they like, they care for each other, you know? Exactly. Like it's truly one big team and you guys are just helping each other out, whether it's your direct or it's, you know, Ronnie's direct. It, it doesn't matter. You're still helping and vice versa. And guys, like that's powerful. So it's like jump on the dial team. Like, please <laughs> love you guys. Um, it will help. Um, now, I'm not going to have you role play the whole thing, Mamu, because you really did role play a good piece of it. But I do think it's important kind of like talk to us a little bit about tonality when you're doing telesales. Like, I know for me, like I'm a really loud person by nature. I just talk really loud. I'm from the Northeast. I'm in your face. I talk fast. And what I realized when calling other areas was like, they hated me. Like, they were like, why? Like, what's her problem? Right. And I was like, okay, I probably got to, you know, calm it down. Talk to us about tonality and why that's really important, especially when you're kind of introducing yourself um, and or the appointment. Yeah. So I, it's just like you heard probably if you listen to all the podcasts, like you just sound like a government worker that works at the DMV. Because like the last thing these people want is someone calling them trying to sell them something. It's like when I talk to someone, like I truly make it seem like I like I am a medical underwriter and I'm just trying to do my job and I really could care less if you get this or not. Like I'm like, hey, you know, Rami, we're looking at your request here, you know, for the discounted final expense programs. You put your birthday February 18, 1944. Is that correct? And then it's just perfect. And then just keeping that tonality the entire time. I feel like that helps a lot. Right. You're not getting too high or too low, no matter what they're telling you. Even if they're like, I really need life insurance. You're not like, oh, okay, awesome. Don't worry. Like you're just going with your actual flow of your appointment. And if it's like, oh, I already got this taken care of. Oh, well, perfect. That makes my job a whole lot easier. You know, who, who'd you get that with? It's not showing on our end. Right. So you're literally like the stance from your mindset is like, I'm a government employee just given a call to do my medical underwriting. And when we can view ourselves that way, it also makes it a lot easier on us. You know, I've gotten like really good rejection over the past eight years. I'm like, hey, like, it's all good. Like, tell me no, like, like, it's fine. Like, like, I can deal with that. But in the beginning, guys, like rejection can be difficult, but it's needed. Like, you need to be rejected to know what it feels like in this business anyways, to not be rejected, right? And when you put yourself in that frame of mind, it really changes how people view you and look at you right? If you look like the salesperson and sound like the salesperson, you're the salesperson. Like if you don't sound like the salesperson, you sound like you're just the medical underwriter. You're just the medical underwriter, right? Like that, that's a big difference in terms of the view, how you're looking at yourself. So if you're looking at yourself in your seat and you're like, I'm the salesperson that's just going to sell people insurance versus I'm the medical underwriter that's going to help people see if they even need this and show them what they qualify for it's a lot better of a stance and you'll probably take the rejection a lot better, right? Like Mahmoud, if you get hung up on, like, do you care? No, I honestly just laugh about it. Right? Like you I'm might back, call, I'll them call them back. Yeah, I'll call them back too. I'll be like, hey, I think we got disconnected. <laughs> it's like the best one liner. Cause it's like, what's the worst they're going to do? Hang up on you again, right? Like that, that's the legit worst thing they could do to you. 
So it's like, guys, we're on the phone. Like we have to just, we're on the phone, we're in the home, whatever it is, like we're just talking to people, right? And I think that that's a big deal. Um, and now the last thing or one of the last things I'm gonna ask you, I'm not gonna have you role play a whole presentation because you did pretty much do that kind of throughout this call, which I appreciate. But would you mind role playing kind of the introduction um, for any type of lead and like just role play with me, like what that should sound like? Yeah. All right, got it. Oh, I'll ring, ring. Hey, Hello? Marissa. Yep. Hey, Marissa, this is Nasser. I'm just giving you a quick call here in, regarding the request we had received for the mortgage protection programs. How are you doing today, okay. ma'am? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. I'm glad to hear you're doing well. I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Uh, so my name is Nasser, ma'am. I was just the medical underwriter here that was assigned to your file for the mortgage protection programs. I'm, my job's super simple. I'm just the one that goes over the eligibility for you and sees what all you qualify for the different programs today, okay? okay. And just to confirm here, you got your birthday, you know, January 15, 1960. Is that correct? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So uh, before we dive into everything, uh, was your main concern like, you know, there's usually two reasons why families send this mortgage protection request in. Uh, one's to primarily make sure that, you know, God forbid when something happens, the mortgage is paid off or two in the event of a sickness, like a heart attack, stroke, cancer, that you're able to keep up with the payments there. Uh, which one was kind of your main concern? Probably, probably both. Okay. No, absolutely. That, that's why most families send this in. Now, uh, before we dive into everything, you get text messages here on this number, right? Yes, I do. Okay. I'm just going to send you over a, a picture of my credentials just because I'm required to. And, and then I'll read off their phone number. And then, okay, I just sent you two pictures. The first image is the credibility sheet. That'll have a list of some of the 36 different A-rated carriers we underwrite for. And I'm sure you're going to recognize a good handful of them, like American General, Aflac, Mutual of Omaha, Aetna, just to name a few. And we specialize in a few things here on our end, uh, mortgage protection, burial insurance, life insurance, and future income planning. Today's for the mortgage protection programs. And then on the second picture there, Marissa, you'll just see a picture of my card. It'll have my face on it just so you can kind of put a, a face to the voice here, okay? All right, I got it. Sounds good. Perfect. And okay, so before we dive into everything, what I'm looking at here in front of me is what we call the client suitability sheet. This is just going to help me best guide how to serve you and the family today and see if we even need something like this put in place, Okay. So we'll just spend about a minute or so on the self and financial situation. That way we're able to see exactly how much coverage you do need. And we make sure whatever plan you customize is going to be affordable and within your budget, just because that's the most important thing. Okay. And then after that, we'll just spend a quick minute or two on your health. And that's going to allow us to navigate and see which one of those 36 A-rated carriers would give you the best benefit today with the highest chance of approval. Does that make sense? It does. Beautiful. Then, yeah, I feel like that right there, it sets it up in, in a way it's like they can't tell you it's free. You know, they can't tell you they can't be surprised from the health questions. And it really just sets the tone of like, all right, this is what we're doing. This is what we're going over. This is how it's going to look like. Right. And they don't it want it sense? then and there. If they don't want it then and there after we went over the why the client suitability sheet, they'll hang up by then. Right. Or you'll get them off the phone because, you know, like, hey, I got my next appointment and yeah. they're not they don't think they need mortgage protection, for example. I love that. And guys, if you notice the whole entire time, like Mahmood was at the same exact tonality. He didn't go high. He didn't go low. He was just right. He was just right here. He was just hanging out. Right. Um, now, what would you say is the biggest kickback that you get, you know, when you're actually when you're calling out? Because you say you pre predominantly one call close. Would you say like you're typically getting an objection before you're getting to that point? Like, hey, I don't have time to do this right now. Or like, I'm at work. You're kind of getting that in the beginning, right? Yeah. So like, you'll get it right in the beginning. And then what I've noticed is like, a lot of them would just like, they'll take the call and then like, yeah, if they're working, like, hey, I'm at work or they'll just give you an objection. Like if they're busy. They'll tell you like, I'm not interested. I don't want it. Leave me alone. And like, I haven't even said a word and they'll hang up. And like yesterday, for a fact, I called the dude. I was like, you don't even know what this is for. And he was like, you're right. And I was like, well, it's for your final expense programs. And he was like, oh, okay. And then I went over it and sold them. It was kind of funny, but it was just like, a lot of these people have like smokescreen objections built into their head. 
just like when we go into the store, like we know exactly what color shirt we want. Like the guy comes up like, hey, can I help you find a, a, a polo or anything? And you're like, no, I'll find it. It's the same exact way. It's like in my eyes, it's like these people sent in a request, whether it was today, yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, they filled out a request for help at some point. And in my eyes, like I'm the person that's going to help them. If I don't help them, like that was their last chance. And that, that's the approach that I take. Right. And that's the mindset that you have to have too to, to see success in this business. And guys, I think just there's been a ton of just jam packed with value from how many leads should you have, what your schedule should look like, plugging in, um, using things like Ringy to help, you know, additional appointments, you know, get people on the phone here, they are kind of everywhere, so to say. Um, how to ask, how to ask and talk about medical, right? Like that's important. And also tonality. The biggest thing I learned in this business was if your tonality is off, just like there's been days, guys, I come onto the team call. Some of you guys might be like, damn, like, is she having a good day? Like, or I might be too high or too low. And I got to try to find my, my medium, if you will. But I'm sure there's been times that you guys popped on and you're like, okay, she's really up here. Or she's like, you know, like her voice is gone, whatever it might be. But when you show up as the person who I have this lead, this request, whatever this family's information in front of me, and I am the one who's going to serve them, your mindset will change. You will become the medical underwriter. But if you're looking at your leads like, oh, each lead is, you know, $8 per lead, wh whatever it is, then you're looking at people like, like a dollar sign. And that's never going to work because now you just put your sales hat back on and it just isn't going to be good for anybody. Um, but with all that, all that being said, um, and also culture, I think that that's huge. And Mahmoud, I just like hats off to you and your group for building that type of culture because it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. But what I'm sure you do know is the people that show up each and every day, those are your business partners that you're going to be working with. And I think that that's amazing and a great identifier. Um, last thing I want to ask you before we jump off, and I appreciate your time so much today, um, annual convention. In your years of being here, have you ever missed an annual convention? No. Okay. And by the way, guys, I didn't know if he had, like, I assume like, you know, Mahmoud's helping literally like probably like a, th a thousand families a year. So I, I figured he hadn't missed one, but talk to us a little bit about why you're going to be at annual convention this year and or how the other annual conventions you've been at have helped serve you in your business. Yeah. So like the first convention I went to in 22, yeah, it was like my second month in. Um, like I literally had just wrote like maybe 12 or 15 for January and like I worked really hard I was hyped for it and then I get to that convention and like I'm literally just sitting there like taking notes like absorbing everything and like you remember how crazy it was like people were lining up at like 5 6 a.m to get the front seats I was one of those people because like I was obsessed with this business you know so like I sat up front like I made sure to listen and then like there was like one guy specifically that stood out to me and it was Shadi Garfay. And like, dude, he had written over a million in business and like his accent was thick and like English wasn't his first language. And I'm not saying that's like make fun of him or anything, but it was just like, well, if he's out there, you know, writing this much insurance, like there's no way I can't do half of that. And I speak perfectly fine. And like, that was the mindset that I had. And it was just like seeing all these different people come up there and like, whether it was a 20 year old, a 30 year old, a 40 year old, 50 year old. And I was just like, it just opened up my eyes. And then like, you just have jam-packed training. You learn from all top producers, top agency owners. And like that day, I mean, whenever I came back, like I tripled my production. I think I wrote like 35 or something that February. And then like I went and wrote 40 the next month. And like it was just like a hot streak. And then, yeah, if you're not at convention, I feel like you're missing out. Like I've, I've heard some guys like, well, I don't want to miss three days of work. You know, it's like, well, dude, if you're stretching those three days of work already, like it it shows you're not working hard enough already, you know? And it's like, you're going to learn and, and get a lot more better just being at the convention and staying around the fire. Absolutely. And, you know, I love how you said too, like, you know, you're in the front, you're excited because like you wanted to, like, you look at this like a business because that is what it is, guys. Even if you're like, I've written one policy, you're a business owner, right? Like get yourself there. And I love how you said I was in the front and, you know, like I was, I resonated with Shadi. Love Shadi. He's awesome. But just like you, you know, you said, he said, you know, 
if Shadi can do it with an accent and with other barriers that, that he has, so to say, and just like other people that you'll see up there, it's like, we can all do it. It's just a matter of if we want to do it, right? Um, so being able to see that, and I think it also shows like, it opens up your, your mind to like, hey, like, it's bigger than just my hierarchy right? Like FFL is bigger than my hierarchy or bigger than the people I, I I talk to, right? Like it's a way bigger company. There's so many other outlets and resources. And one thing I always say, like, who are the three people you're listening to this week, like to train? Or who are your three people you always listen to that help that you train with? So to say, like you watch their training back to back to back. Being able to see that live and talk to that person and ask direct questions, it's powerful. Mahmoud just said he went there. He he had helped, you know, 12, 13 families. He was jacked up. He's like, let's do this thing. He left and he was helping over 30, 35 families. And you've never went back really since on that. Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, guys, you can miss three days of work to come back and be able to literally like quadruple your production, like in, in three days of actual intentional training, go there with the mindset of like, I'm coming here to better my business. You know, someone asked me, Mahmoud, the other day, like, why are you going to convention? I don't know if they really liked my answer, but my answer was, I'm going for me. Like, I'm going because I need help with my business, because I want to talk to people about my business. That's the number one reason I'm going. So the number one reason that everybody should be going is because, like, you want to do better for your business. And that's what Mahmoud left, um, you know, led with. So it's like, guys, get yourself there. Again, we're talking about going from 12 to 15 families to 35 families. and it, are we guaranteeing that? No. But if you sit in the front and you're intentional when you're there, I would not be surprised if you walked out with the same result. Um, Mahmoud, anything you want to share before you hop off? Uh, yeah, let's go into the new year strong. Make 2024 your year. Like you guys have, we have all the resources available at our fingertips and just make sure you utilize them. Absolutely. Great tip. I appreciate you so much for being on with us today. Can't thank you enough. Make it a great Thursday and let's go into 2024. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me on.